Our text this morning is from the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. Will you stand as I read through the passage this morning from God's Word? 1 John, chapter 5, verses 6 through 10. I'm reading from the New King James this morning, but you can follow along with whatever rendering you have. John says, This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God which he has testified of his Son. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we have once again this morning to freely and openly come together and lift up our voices to you in praise and song and to study your word together. We are thankful, Father, that as we are gathered together, we are brothers and sisters in your family adopted by you. And we're thankful, Father, that as such, we are also indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God that gives us insight into the scriptures, illumination of your word, and also the power to take the words from the page and to put them into practice in our daily life. We just pray, Father, as we are gathered together here this morning to study your word, that we can set aside all the cares and concerns and distractions of the world around us in our daily life to just focus upon the things of your word and the assurance that that brings to us. Father, we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. A college professor condescendingly confronted a girl that was in his class because she believed in Jesus. He said, you know, there have been many throughout history who have claimed that they were God. How can you be sure who told the truth? Which one of these men could you actually believe? And she said, well, I believe the one who rose from the dead. Good answer. In the first paragraph of 1 John chapter 5, it ends with verse 5, where John concludes with this statement. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That's how we overcome the world, by believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Okay, so how can any person come to believe then that Jesus is the Son of God? John's answer is that our faith depends upon the testimony that's been provided to us and that the reasonableness of believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God is grounded upon the validity of that testimony that's been given about him. And that's really what John is saying here in the passage that we're looking at this morning in verses 6 through 10. Admittedly, it's a difficult passage. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of different opinions of what people believe. I have my own opinion of what the passage means, of exactly what John is referencing. But before we dive into it this morning, I want us to back up and possibly understand why John wrote what he wrote. The reason he wrote what he wrote is because there were false teachers in circulation at this time who were saying things about Jesus that were not true. Definitely did not accord to the word of God. And so when we see that and we understand what's happening, I think we'll understand more why Paul, excuse me, why John wrote what he wrote here in these verses. John's main point in writing the letter was to confront false teaching. From the very outset, we saw that that was the case. He was confronting the false teachers especially false teaching about the person of Jesus Christ. You know, one of the teachings gaining popularity at this time was that Jesus was just a man. When Jesus was born and when he lived his childhood and his uh, 20s, he was just a man. But the spirit of the Christ descended upon him at his baptism, you see. But then later on, the spirit of the Christ left him. You see, that teaching goes something like this, that Jesus is just a man, but the Christ is the spirit of the Christ who is 
God. So they taught that Jesus was a prophet of God, just a man, though, a prophet of God, but that Christ was God in the Spirit, and while Christ came upon Jesus at his baptism, Jesus was not the Christ. You follow? You're like, no, I'm lost already. <laughs> oh, they're saying that uh, he is not the Christ. Jesus was not the Son of God. <clears throat> Basically what they're doing, you see, is differentiating between Jesus the man and Christ who is God. Uh, and they're saying that those two are two distinct things. So that the Christ did not die on the cross. That was the man Jesus. Because by that point, the spirit of the Christ had departed from Jesus. And so it was just the man Jesus who died on the cross. Well, because these false teachers claimed that, uh, that it was just Jesus who went to the cross, then uh, the death of Jesus Christ on the Calvary had no real meaning. And they just could not fathom that God would humble himself and suffer humiliation and torture and death at the hands of his own creation. Therefore, they didn't think that the death of Jesus played any important role in us being forgiven because they just could not accept Jesus as God. Biblically speaking, to say that Jesus is the Son of God is to say that he is God. In Bible days, when people wanted to describe the nature of someone, they would use the phrase that they were the Son of. And there are a few of these that you are familiar with. For example, Judas is described as the son of perdition, the son of destruction. Why? Because he was headed for perdition. He was headed for destruction. Uh, another one that you're probably very familiar with, Barnabas is described as the son of encouragement. Barnabas was an encouragement to the church in Jerusalem. Uh, he's the one who sold his land and gave the proceeds to the church from that sale, which apparently was a great sum of money. So he encouraged the church in that way. Um, the, the Jerusalem church, he encouraged Paul, who at first was rejected by the church at Jerusalem. They, they were afraid of him at first. But Barnabas was the first one to go out and meet the Apostle Paul and befriend him. He encouraged John Mark, an early washout in the ministry. Remember, John Mark went with Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey, but then he abandoned them and went back home. But later, John Mark became a spiritual leader and a writer of one of the Gospels that you have in your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes, that Mark, the Gospel of Mark. That is John Mark. The one that who, who deserted Paul and Barnabas on that first missionary journey. Barnabas encouraged him. Barnabas was called the son of encouragement because he was an encourager by nature, you see. In the same way, Jesus Christ is called the son of God because he, in his very nature, is God himself. God in the flesh. Paul presents that very clearly in Philippians chapter 2. When I was telling you about what the... the Gnostics were believing and teaching at this time about Jesus Christ, did you automatically think, uh, well, when I said he couldn't humiliate himself and submit to torture and pain and even death, did any of you think, well, that's what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2? Just curious, because that is exactly what Paul says. Turn back to Philippians chapter 2. Starting with verse 5. You know, when we read some of these letters to the churches that the Apostle Paul wrote, we can see that there were problems in the churches, uh, like in Corinth. Man, there seemed to be several different issues there that the Apostle Paul drew, addressed in Corinth. But when we write to, uh, when we see the letter that he wrote to the Philippians there at the church at Philippi, we say, man, that is a mature church. But do you know, they had some issues as well. Division was part of their problem. They were divided. They were, they were not united together. And Paul puts his thumb on it that one of the problems that was causing their division was pride. Very difficult for us to swallow our pride. But he says, we need to be humble. We need to swallow our pride and be humble. And he points to the humility of Jesus Christ 
as an example that we were to follow. Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Sometimes people struggle with it. What does that mean there? Didn't want, it basically just means he didn't consider his position as being a God in the heavens as something that he had to hold on to at all costs. Um, he was willing to lay that aside to become human, to take on the form of human flesh. And so that's what Paul says as we continue in verse 7. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Um, I like the way Stephen Smith describes it in his book, Dying to Preach. Uh, I'm going to read you a passage, so forgive me for just reading uh, some text here, but I don't want to mess this up. He says, while Christ took on the form of a human, he set aside his rights as God. In other words, all of Christ's time on earth, he was always God-like. When he was in Samaria, he was all-powerful. When he was asking questions in the temple, he was all-knowing. And when he was present in a particular place, he was omnipresent. It's just simply that he made a choice not to take hold of what was always and always will be his, namely his godlike properties. Imagine that you're visiting a hospital and you can't find a parking space in the hospital parking lot or anywhere near the hospital, so you end up parking a long way away from the hospital and now you're lost. You finally found a parking spot, but you don't know where you are. So you stop another driver who is passing by to ask directions to the hospital. But the driver kindly says that he will just park his car by yours and walk you to the hospital to where you need to be. Now suppose that as you get close to the hospital, you find that this man who parked beside you, who is walking with you, is actually the chief surgeon of the hospital. And as you approach the front of the hospital, right up near the entrance, he points out an empty parking space that says reserved, and he says, that's my spot. That's my parking place. You see, he had a superior advantage because of his status. However, in deference to your needs, he did not take his rightful parking spot but instead met you where you were and walked with you the whole way. So here's the question. As he was walking with you, did he stop becoming, did he stop being a doctor? No. Did he have a rightful parking place? Yes. He had all of the things at any time that he could have laid hold of being in the position that he was, but he did not use them. For your sake, he chose not to in that particular moment. That's exactly how it is with Jesus Christ. He didn't cease to become God. He simply chose to lay aside some of his privileges as God to come and walk with us in our need. The Apostle John has relentlessly hammered home this fact throughout this epistle, that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and that the truth of the correct view of the Lord Jesus Christ is essential to our salvation. And he continues that argument in these verses before us today. So I hope knowing the context about what John was battling will help give us a little better understanding of why he wrote what he wrote. A little better grasp of what he means in these verses here before us this morning. So let's look at verse 6 again. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6. This is he who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness because the Spirit is true. So here's the first major hurdle what does the water represent? He came by water and blood, not water only, but also in blood. What truth 
Does the Spirit testify about Jesus where this water is concerned? There are two major schools of thought on this, and both of them carry some weight and both fit into the context of what the water could testify to. So I'm going to present both of them to you. The first this morning is that the water represents the water of the baptism of Jesus Christ, testifying to the humanity of Jesus as the Son of God. You know, when the Lord Jesus Christ came out to be baptized, John was hesitant to baptize him. Why? Because that baptism was a baptism of repentance. And that's what John went out preaching, repent and be baptized. It was to turn back to God from your sinful, evil ways and turn back to God. That's what the repent was here. A change of mind, a change of heart. Well, when the Lord Jesus Christ came out and wanted to be baptized, what did he have to repent of? Nothing. And that's why John was hesitant. Like, you know, I don't want to baptize you. You're, you're the sinless son of God. But Jesus Christ identified himself fully with the sinful human race. And that's why he submitted to water baptism there. So the water could represent the water of his baptism. Because the false teaching going around at that time was claiming, again, that the spirit of the Christ came down upon Jesus the man at this time that he was water baptized, but departed from him before suffering and uh, dying on the cross. It would seem that the opponents of John would not disagree with that water uh, in this respect, that it would uh, testify of the Christ being upon Jesus Christ at his baptism. But those opponents would have an issue with the blood part of this. And we're going to get to that in a moment because John says not just the water, but blood also. So the argument would go that if John's opponents are talking about the water of baptism, then he too is using it speaking of the water of baptism of Jesus, but not in the same way that they were talking about it. Because he's talking about the witness of the Spirit in connection to that water. The Spirit of truth. He's saying that God confirmed the truth of Jesus Christ as the Son of God at that baptism. And the Spirit of truth testifies to that. Turn back to Matthew chapter 3. This is the account of the baptism. Matthew chapter 3. In verse 13, it says, Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized of him. And verse 14, it says, John tried to prevent it. Um, but let's pick up with verse 16. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit testifies that God the Father said, This, Jesus, is my beloved Son. He is the Son of God. So John would say that the humanity of Jesus as the Son of God is testified to by the events that surround this baptism here. He identified himself with the human race in this baptism, but that God spoke the truth about who Jesus was in being his Son as well. Yes, he was a man, and he identified himself with mankind, but at the same time, he was also God. God in the flesh. The Father testifying, this is my beloved Son. Uh, God who had become flesh, you see. A second popular view is that the water represents the water of the womb. You see, testifying uh, to the humanity of Jesus Christ in childbirth. Uh, not just water, but water and the blood. Testifying again of the humanity of Jesus as God. Um, both of those options testify to the humanity of Jesus, uh, the, the water baptism that he submitted himself to, or being born of a virgin. And so it would be the Son of God becoming human flesh. The virgin birth of the Son of God into this world testifies to the fact that Jesus, as the Son of God, did in fact take on human form, became flesh. Perhaps John simply borrowing from the teachings of Jesus when he met with Nicodemus. You remember that? Turn to John chapter 3. 
I mean, it's the same author. John wrote 1 John. It's the same John that wrote the Gospel of John, which we are turning to now. So John recorded this conversation that took place between Jesus and Nicodemus. And Jesus said a similar thing when he was talking to Nicodemus. John chapter 3, starting with verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the womb? Uh, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? So John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So John is saying that God came in flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the Christ, the Son of God. And water would mean um, here the water of the womb and testify to the miracle of the virgin birth. Jesus Christ coming as a man, taking on the form of human flesh. Some of the false teachers were also claiming that the Son of God was not really a human at all. So the water would testify that Jesus Christ was human here in the sense, being born um, in a fleshly state as such, of course, he had to be human. And also the Son of God had taken on that form. One thing John had proclaimed over and over and over in this letter is the humanity of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, but that Jesus was also the Christ. He was the Christ. Turn back to 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2 and verse 22. John says, Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Not two separate distinct individuals, you see. Not Jesus the man who the spirit of the Christ descended upon, but Jesus is the Christ. Uh, look at chapter 3 and verse 23. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Uh, skip down to verse 15. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 15. Whosoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And in verse 5. Who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? So those are the two best options for what the water represents here, uh, whether it be the water of the baptism, of Jesus Christ or the water of the birth of Jesus Christ, but regardless of which one of those it represents, it still testifies to the truth that Jesus Christ is the Christ. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, God in human form, God in the flesh. What does the blood represent then? And what truth does that testify about Jesus Christ? Well, the blood represents the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary, obviously testifying to the ministry of atonement from the Son of God as His blood was shed on that cross. These false teachers were claiming that the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross had no atoning value because, again, they couldn't believe that God would submit Himself to that and so that the Spirit of the Christ had departed prior to the cross. They agreed that there was a man named Jesus who died upon the cross. They just didn't believe that it had any atoning value whatsoever for our sin. John had stressed earlier his opposition to this. Um, look at uh, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the one who died on that cross. Not Jesus just as a man, but Jesus as God died on that cross for our sins. Jesus as the Son of God 
being very God in the flesh, the Christ, suffered and died on the cross as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22 plainly states with, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The blood and the events around the shedding of his blood testify to the atoning ministry of Jesus Christ that was accomplished on the cross for us. And so it is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's blood, shed on the cross of Calvary that removes our sin from us. Just as the hymn by Lewis Edgar Jones says, that you're very familiar with, that we sing quite often, there is power in the blood. I believe John would have especially liked the very first opening stanza of that hymn. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood. Would you over evil of victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. It is the blood of Jesus Christ that gives us those things. Freedom from the burden of sin and victory over evil. Only the shed blood of the Son of God could cleanse us from our sins. Jesus was, in fact, the Lamb of God. He died for our sins. And we read in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, the Apostle Paul there states that God purchased us with His own blood. So the testimony of the water and the blood, I, I believe it's the bookends of Jesus Christ's ministry. From the beginning to the end, He was God. From the baptism, He was God in the flesh. To the death of Jesus Christ, where He shed His blood on the cross of Calvary, He was the Son of God, God in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Beginning to end in His ministry. Not just the water, you see, because they... They were saying that at the baptism, the Spirit of the Christ descended upon him, but left at some point, and then he, the Spirit of the Christ wasn't on Jesus at the cross of Calvary. He says, no, not just the water, not just the water only, but the blood also, all the way to the cross, all the way to his death. That was Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is a witness to the Son of God and also to the saint. We find that the character of the witness in the heavenly realm, um, uh, and, and excuse me, we, we find the character of the witness in the heavenly realm and also the witness in the earthly realm. Um, in verse 7, it speaks of the three witnesses in the heavenly realm. So let's look at that. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 7. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. What does it sound like to you? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are what? One. Perfect unity in those three. Who's the Word, by the way? Jesus Christ. So this sounds like what? The Trinity. The Godhead. There are those that believe that the, this portion of Scripture here in verse 7 and part of uh, verse 8 shouldn't be here. There's something called textual criticism. Um, taught in seminary classes. Sometimes it's called manuscript evidence. And what that is all about is how did we get our Bible? Where did it come from? I mean, you have yours printed off of a printing press, but is that where the Word of God originated when it came off the printing press? No. Did the Word of God originate when the printing press was invented? No. The Word of God was here before that. So how did they have it back then if they didn't have a printing press? They hand wrote it, copied it meticulously, line by line, word by word, letter by letter, meticulously copied it. And what happened when that started to get frayed from use? After all, the parchment paper that they used back then wasn't as durable as the paper that you use now. It would wear out much, much quicker than this paper does. So what would they do? They had to make a new copy. Another copy. And so that's how the Word of God was spread. From, you know, they can't be here, so now you've got to make a copy to go over there. And so it was a copy of a copy of a copy. And you had all these copies everywhere. That even in that location, it was a copy of a copy of a copy in that location. But God ordained those copies. And God oversaw those copies, right? But then later on, there were some other manuscripts found that didn't agree with all those copies of the copies of the copies. 
They had been set aside. And so the school of thought there, when those didn't agree with all of those copies, is that older is better. Is that true? Not necessarily true, is it? I mean, to have that kind of mindset, you have to think of it in this way. When they pulled out this one manuscript, you see, that disagrees with all the copies everybody had, then you have to say, oh man, guess what? This is what God really meant. Is that the God you serve? I'm going to tell you straight up, that's not the God I serve. The God I serve providentially oversaw the, the word that he wanted us to have. And there, I can't believe there is any way that God would allow what he really meant to be hidden away in this one manuscript somewhere that nobody was reading and nobody saw. You know what I believe? There was a reason that one manuscript was set aside. It's not just one, but what I'm saying is there are manuscripts that are one-offs. And there's a reason they were set aside. Why? Because there were errors found in them. Um, in fact, just this week, there was an, just past week, there was an article that came out that they found uh, on old parchment paper, three layers deep under that, that there was a recording of one of the chapters of the book of Matthew. They used ultraviolet light, you see, the parchment was hard to come by at times, and so what they would do at times is once the parchment had been written on, if they needed it for something else, they would erase what was on that parchment and write something else on there. And they might use it several times. And so that was the case here. They found a passage of the book of Matthew, the book of Matthew uh, chapter, three layers deep. But you know what? It didn't agree with what you have. And so now they're studying intently to see exactly what it said so that they can see what God really meant. What did the book of Matthew really say way back then? You know what I say? There's a reason that manuscript was erased. Because it was not correct. What does your faith tell you? I mean, does it really make sense that God would hide or destroy what he really had to say while you have what you have in your lap. Again, that's not the God I serve. This verse fits, and the words here fit. So why take them out? Why do you take the scalpel into your hand and do surgery on the word of God? Don't do it. It's a dangerous precedent, my friends, to do that. For you to start hacking on the word of God to decide what you want to keep and what you want to throw out. I said at the start that the passage today is about testimony. It's important to know that in the Jewish mind, testimony was only accepted in the presence of two or three witnesses, right? That goes all the way back to the Mosaic Law. In Deuteronomy chapter 19 and verse 15, it says, one witness is not enough to convict a man accused of any crime or offense that he may have committed. A matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So John goes above the two. John gives us three witnesses here in verse 7. The full Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. In keeping with water being a reference to the baptism of Jesus, we, all, we see all three persons of the Godhead present at that event. As Jesus, the Son of God, was the one being baptized, and then the voice of God the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. So there are three witnesses also in the earthly realm. In verse 8, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 8, and there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree as one. Again, John lists the water, the blood, and the Holy Spirit. I think I spent adequate time on that already back in verse 6, so I'm not going to go any further of those. But we have this unanimous threefold witness, both in the heavenly realm and in the human realm. And that's enough. It should be enough, especially concerning the credibility of the witness that we have. Great and wonderful and manifold are the varied witnesses of God to the effectual work that was wrought on our behalf by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. John points out now that his witness carries with it its own commendation. Look at verse 9. 
If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God that he has testified of his son. Um, look down at the end of uh, the second half of verse 10. He who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his son. You know, most of the things we know, we know it because we've been told it or we've read it. Most of the information we have then, you see, is received from human sources, meaning that in almost every aspect of life, we accept the witness of men in matters far less significant than what concerns our eternal destiny. John's logic is that if we accept the testimony of men, how much more then should we accept the testimony of God the Father, who cannot lie, and especially regarding his testimony of his Son? If we accept the testimony of men, God is greater. You're familiar with the courtroom scenes, right? In which the witnesses are sworn in to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. What? So help me God. That's done to ensure that the witnesses know that the court expects them to tell the truth. And that if they do not tell the truth, and sometimes they don't tell the truth, they perjure themselves by their lie and could therefore bring punishment upon themselves for their lie. However, it's impossible for God to perjure himself because God cannot lie. God can only tell the truth. He has never uttered a statement that could be construed as a false statement in any way. Therefore, his testimony must be accepted as truth. And God has told us that Jesus Christ is God, the Son of God, God in the flesh. And that witness carries with it also its own conviction. Look at the first part of verse 10. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. Those who are born again in Christ, reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, have the witness that we've spoken of here within them. The witness of the Holy Spirit. He is a reliable witness. And every believer is indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit bears witness that our salvation is sufficient and it is sure. Romans chapter 8 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul said, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit himself, bears witness with our spirit to make us sure that we are God's children. Dwight Moody says that early on his faith wasn't very strong and that one of the things he would do quite often was pray for more faith. Pray for faith and pray for more faith. And then one day he read across Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 and it struck him like it hadn't before. Faith comes by what? Hearing. Hearing what? The Word of God. So where does faith come from? It comes from the Word of God and taking the Word of God upon faith. So Dwight Moody said that in that day, I started reading the Word of God in faith and noticed that my faith began to grow dramatically. Read the Word of God in faith. Trust the witness of God the witness of the Word of God, the witness of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that Jesus Christ is, in fact, God in the flesh, who shed His blood on the cross of Calvary for us, and that His payment was indeed sufficient for our sins. His blood, yes, is absolutely necessary. His atoning death is the only thing that could ever cleanse us from our sins the blood of God. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time that we've had looking at your word this morning. And we thank you again for it, that you have not only made yourself known, but it's written down, it's recorded, and we know that it is meticulous, meticulously kept from generation to generation, and that you are a God of providence who is able to oversee the transmission of your word to us so that we have it in our own language, that we can read and understand what you, our Heavenly Father, the God of creation, desires for us.
But most of all, Father, we are thankful that as we read in it, we read of your love, your great and awesome and matchless and marvelous love for us that extends to us your marvelous and matchless grace. Father, I just pray that each person listening today has accepted this gift of eternal life that you are offering through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Knowing, Father, it is the only way we can ever be cleansed. We can't be good enough. We can't earn our way to heaven. But Jesus Christ has already done everything on our behalf. All we have to do is accept this gift, this gift of salvation, this gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Father, it's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We give you all the praise. Amen.